this, this presentation also has to do a lot with uh, soft, the process of developing software. Uh, the Aerospace Corporation about five years ago decided that, well, in, in the words of our president and CEO, space was getting, uh, taking too long and getting very expensive. And so much of it was that projects were not coming in on time, not coming in within budget, and we needed a way to understand why that was happening. And so uh, they were turning to uh, what we call dynamic modeling and, and it's simulation, but I often and avoid the word simulation because of some of the connotations it carries. But in any case, what we're trying to do is understand uh, the behavior of these projects and a lot of it comes down to the, to the rework cycles. Uh, Kenneth Cooper, back in the 80s, kind of pioneered this field using system dynamics modeling. It's a continuous form of simulation. And is, he uh, did it on a shipbuilding operation. Navy was building a, sh uh, having a ship built at the Ingalls uh, shipyards. And uh, they were able to model the development of the ship and uh, it went to court. They used the model to help uh, the case understand the uh, secondary and follow-on effects of some of the changes that were coming through made a big difference. So he went on later to establish a consultancy and change impact analysis and still works at that. Uh, but what he came to was the underlying dynamic of uh, product development projects, uh, and we find this particularly in software, is the uh, rework cycle. And so we produce something here, we check it, and that check can take the form of, of a review, of a, an analysis with tools, uh, some testing, whatever, but we're going to identify the, uh, the rework versus what can go on, and what goes on then goes into the next cycle, and again, but the the trick here is that we've got to watch for the rework that has to go back upstream. And so we've got uh, rework slipping between phases. He identified the underlying problem as an inability to account for quality and undiscovered rework in progress measures. And so we're going along saying we've made this much progress, we've made this much progress, and in fact we really don't know because there's so much undiscovered rework. So over the last, I'd say, three decades of working with modeling <coughs> projects, the system dynamics folks have come to uh, call the rework cycle the most important feature or even the canonical structure that underlies modeling of products. Now, when we get into software, um, all of this kind of gets magnified when we're working with software because of the lack of the constraints uh, that we have in hardware. And so it even is amplified more when we get into a test and fix cycle, which is if we ever, if everybody got into continuous integration like you were just talking about, then we probably wouldn't have this kind of problem, but we do. And we were finding that a lot of the projects uh, that are going on for SMC, they were getting into integration, are getting into integration, this still happens, and uh, it just goes on and on and on. They never know when they're gonna end. So they might say, they might have a plan for eight months and it ends up taking 15 months or 24 months, whatever, to get through integration because of all the problems. So this is uh, what we're, this is the kind of thing that we've been dealing with. Uh, I got called in to model uh, about three years ago one of these because they simply needed to know when are we going to be done? And there was a launch date at stake and the date kept slipping and slipping and so they wanted something firm to avoid all this constant replanning so they could identify a clear launch window. So went and modeled it and came out with the fact that yes, we, we can say that it's gonna take this much longer and it's despite the four slips, you can ignore those three in between slips and just pay attention to that last one. 
A lot of times what happens is we find that, that uh, the metrics being used, test cases executed right up here, uh, let's see, right down here where we're doing this testing, the uh, number of test cases executed and the number of defects found and fixed, uh, defect backlog reduction, and then uh, the test cases completed, these are, I, you can think of them as kind of spot metrics. They, they identify what's going on at a particular spot in the process, but they don't capture the dynamics of the whole process. And so uh, we look to the number of rework cycles per test case because that's how many times we're having to go take a test case and go around this rework cycle. So there were six projects where we have modeled the uh, rework cycling in integration, and they have been all different kinds of uh, software, flight software, payload, ground, uh, been produced by different organizations. Uh, it's both embedded and non-embedded, real time and NRT. Uh, the development time frames have been from a few months to, to a few years. And the software characteristics, other than the quality, as it's reflected in the number of rework cycles, is not uh, apropos to this. It's primarily uh, a process issue. So we, we focus on the process characteristics and use discrete, discrete event modeling. Uh, the we use the uh, counts of test cases and rework cycles. Uh, we're looking at how to facilitate verification. Uh, the entities uh, in the model for a discrete event, the entities that are representing test cases. And our primary activities are testing and fixing, although we can put in other activities that might be important to a process. Sometimes the analysis, uh, there's an analysis step there. Sometimes the build step's important. And then, of course, our primary resources are test facilities, testers, and fixers. So when we look at the output of these models, uh, generally we're looking for the completion of test cases. When are they finally running? And so we'll plot that. And ordinarily, we'll see three regions in a plot like this. The first region is curved right in here. And it's as the process fills up it reaches its capacity for processing test cases. And then, it, and then there's a straight line with steady output. And then there's a kind of a fold over as we're pulling the last test cases out of the process. We have, uh, I mentioned six projects where we did this. And so in looking at forecast made at the time the problem was presented to us, uh, to um, against the um, plan at that time. We, you can see uh, in one case we had two and a half to one, the forecast. Uh, we forecasted that it was going to take two and a half times longer than, than what the schedule was. And the question is, did it, did it uh, come within a prediction interval? This is a 95% prediction interval around, and so this is an average that comes out of the model. And uh, when we do this, we track uh, within this interval and watch to see if it follows within that interval. So that's the interval that's being referred to right here. For uh, A, D, and F, these large projects, you can see that we forecasted well beyond what the plan was. Uh, for the smaller projects, we simply confirmed that their schedules were going to work out. Um, took some heroic efforts to make it work, but they worked out. And then there was one project where we, it was very early estimate and they didn't uh, keep us monitoring it, so uh, we didn't have results to report there. Uh, we were off in one case here, 9% off. Uh, but you can see overall this method of looking at the number of rework cycles is a very good way of looking at uh, and forecasting how long it's going to take to get through integration for a large system. In, I, I should mention too, in addition to the forecast, there's also a lot of other benefits. We're looking at process improvements. We're looking at ways to, uh, to um, keep a schedule. It's very hard at this point, of course, to pull in a schedule, but to keep a schedule, keep it from 
from pushing out even further. So with the six projects we had, uh, we looked at this and said we can do more with this. So we took them and, and analyzed commonality and the variation between the six models in order to come up with a generalizable model and there were three dimensions uh, that we focused on. One was the scope because everybody has a different process. And some people have multiple rework cycles in there, some have reviews they put in between these and so forth and so uh, had to look at the scope. Uh, we ended up focusing just on one rework cycle. That was the scope we took for the model because typically there's one rework cycle that is the dominant uh, cycle in the whole <coughs> process that's going to push everything else out. The uh, real work is in the components, the resources, the, the steps, and so forth, uh, the parameters, what, uh, what is it that goes into the model there. And this portrays just a simple model where we queue up test cases and then run them through testing uh, ask whether or not they've completed the, their number of rework cycles. And uh, if, they've, if, they've, if it's done, it passes on. If it doesn't, it goes back and into a rework queue. And again, it cycles through here. And when it gets, of course, to testing, we're drawing upon test and test testers and test facilities. And down here, we're drawing upon the reworkers. And um, this is the side that we usually have more visibility to. This I call the dark side or the underside because it's really hard to know how long that rework is going to take oftentimes. So when we looked at what was common, um, this chart on the right here is a list of all of the components through all of the models, the six models we looked at. The items in bold showed up in every model and the other items were variations. Uh, we, we produced a simple model, but then we also went on and generalized it and produced one model with everything in it, so they become options for configuring to any process that we're trying to model. The third element, or the third dimension, uh, is the parameter values, and these simply vary from process to process. And so this little table gives an idea of the range of values for some of the parameters in the model. Uh, the number of test facilities can vary widely. Uh, for some of the embedded flight software projects we dealt with, we're down to one or two uh, test beds. Um, if it's software to software integration, uh, for a terminal, we might end up with uh, a room full of PCs that are being worked with and so forth. And down here, of course, we're using distributions. Now, on the number of rework cycles, uh, th this is not a metric that people normally keep, but it's one that I'm encouraging because it becomes so meaningful in how long it takes to get the work done. And what I have found, and it has surprised me, that, that testers, the people who are working with the test cases, <coughs> they can talk about looking at a group of particular group of test cases, the relative complexity of them, how long it's going to take to get them through, how many times they're going to have to send that test case back for re re rework. And when I say send that test case, I'm taking the test case with conceptually that implies all of the rework that goes with it. Now it's not the, it's not the same as the number of defects because they may find one defect and then they will uh, keep going and as far as they can. They'll have several defects that will cause suspension of testing and then they have to send it back for rework. But they can usually say, uh, here's how many test cases, or here, here, I'm sorry, here's how many rework cycles. Uh, it will take a minimum and a maximum. And we can use the uniform distributions in the model to get some good probabilities across uh, a large number of test cases. And I've seen them go whether, of course, there's some that will pass through right away, and there's some that have taken 60 rework cycles to get through. So the generalized model that we produced, uh, it supports three types of scenarios. Uh, one case is where we have uh, one type of testing 
all the testing's performed by one group of testers, and uh, we have one set of test cases and one type of test facility. So that would be the simplest kind. But we've also run into situations where we have different types of testing, and sometimes that's distinguished, for example, between software-to-software -software integration and, and uh, hardware-software integration. And uh, other times it's uh, distinguished by level of integration. So we'll end up with uh, multiple concurrent <coughs> test and fix cycles. We'll have multiple sets of test cases. And, uh, and then the third is where we have differently qualified test facilities. So uh, particularly uh, in the light software, not all the test beds are qualified to the same level, and so it means that we start having to do some routing with the, with the uh, last testing being done on the most highly qualified uh, test beds. And in those cases, then we get into having to balance the testing load across those facilities in order to keep things moving. This is just a, an excerpt from the model. It's implemented in a tool called ExtendSim. And uh, the flows here, we've got one type of testing would use this top flow. When we've got uh, different types of testing, it'll, it'll flow through here and then, and then uh, be uh, routed according to the type of testing. And then where we've got differently qualified test beds, there's two routes and they're routed according to the number of uh, uh, the, the test queue that needs to be selected. So using the model and, and putting it to work to learn something, uh, we looked at two things. Um, in the world of lean development, and this is, this is part of uh, the whole agility world, uh, there's a couple of things that are managed there. One is work in progress. How much work do I let into the, into, uh, the queue at a time? And then, of course, the other is prioritization of the work. And I worked with one where they had, I think it was um, eight test beds and eight testers, so they said we can have no more than eight test cases in process at one time. Turns out um, that's a very tight constraint, and I'll show you that on the next slide here. The other thing too, though, is, is a prioritization. What order do we do the testing in? And it can, it, we can just take it as it comes, as it becomes available. Uh, all, oftentimes all the test cases are available and so they can be ordered uh, by doing the most risky first. But other times there's pressure to start showing releases and people are tempted just to take the easy ones first so they can show progress. Uh, for this experiment, uh, I said four, I added a fifth one here. There's no whip limit, uh, first in, first out. Here the whip limit is 10, where uh, we've got 10 testers, test beds, and software fixers. Here the whip limit is uh, 15, and we're doing the most rework first. So in other words, the test cases that are the riskiest, we're going to do the first. Then what I call a tester pool, and that is, uh, if a tester finds themselves waiting for work, there's nothing coming back from rework and they need something to do, they can go to the queue that holds the test cases that have not been into testing yet. Uh, we, can, when we can prioritize that first in, first out, or most rework first. So if we look at plots as to how those come out, you can see right off the bat here that uh, this, this orange dash line right here where the whip limit is 10. So the whip limit matches the resources. It actually takes longer because uh, the testers are not fully engaged and our, uh, let's see, our utilization down here is very low of our resources. So we can take, we can dismiss this case right here and say that's not a desirable case. What happens with the others, though, is more interesting. They tend to come in about the same time. The duration will be right around 31, 32 weeks in this example. And so we have to ask ourselves, which of these is more desirable? And uh, we can say, if there's no whip limit right here, we just load everything up, we fill up the, the process, and for a long time, and, and it's much slower to get stuff out, 
But then once, as we get towards the end, it all comes out right here, very steep curve. The, um, the tester pool turns out to be one where it's pretty much a straight line. So the difference between these three cases and this case is that we're showing continuous progress. So this will oftentimes be desirable if we've got managers who are saying, I want to see progress. And these, uh, you can see that they, uh, again, they, they're not reassuring along the way, but, um, but you do get good results in the end. And to distinguish between these, oftentimes it's helpful to go down and look at the utilization figures and the time and process. The time and process, how long does a test case spend in this whole process? If we're trying to learn from our early test cases about um, the system and its behavior, then we'll want a short time and process. And so we'll look down to here, uh, and that, that would leave out this uh, no whip limit FIFO case right up here, that one right there. And uh, so it turns out that uh, generally this test, these tester pull, these are pretty good, and, and uh, this one, this FIFO case, is probably the most desirable for most situations. So lessons coming out of this. Um, the WIP limit's gonna reduce the time and process, and that's what the lean folks are after when they specify uh, a WIP limit. Uh, however, if it gets too close to uh, the, the uh, number of resources, then it can be a constraining factor, so you have to uh, add some to it. And then prioritizing test cases by uh, expected rework or complexity or risk, however those are being judged. Uh, you never want to leave the hard ones till last because what happens is that tail leans way over and it just drags out the whole process. And when that happens, there's a few people working a few test cases and there's a lot of waiting time, low utilization. So when, oops, when we do, uh, when we do get to um, find that we have low process capacity utilization, becomes an opportunity for balancing between the activities. So if the low utilization is on the test side, you get more testers in or more test facilities. Uh, if it's uh, on the rework side, of course, we need more developers doing fixes. So. In conclusion and summary, uh, we've analyzed uh, the commonality and variation across six models of test and fix cycles and uh, specified a uh, generalized model and built it and used it to learn something about some process behavior. And we'll be continuing this and um, hopefully, my goal is to see if we can't come out with some uh, formulas that we can use, do some research and come out with some analytical formulas that can be used as guidance. That's the, that's the story right there. Any questions or? So on the slide a couple back here where you had uh, uh, this one, is the utilization, is that any kind of measure of the, the cost of the, you know, how much time that tester spent or is that not quite reading that? Yes, that's right. It's, it's utilization of resources and this particular number is across all resources, testers, test beds, and developers. And so the, it would seem like though that 56 is awful appealing if you get to the same place at the end at the same time. I, I, I realize the one's a straight line, but it seems like if you're looking at the cost of things, that one seems to be the one that I would like to take. And, and, and see, this is where it gets into a question of policy, because how much management pressure, a lot of managers figure that I've got to keep everybody busy, Yeah. okay? But you can point out here, you don't have to. You can still get the same results. My managers are more like, don't spend money. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. I'd say velocity in Scrum is more throughput 
It's a throughput measure. And um, so it would be more like, um, it's very closely related to the time and process. How fast can I get something through? Okay, the process. These two are definitely related, but utilization is the utilization. It's a resource characteristic. So of the resources, how busy are my resources through this whole time right here? Chris. Could you stress the same issue about the total number of tests you're going to do when you begin? Yes, they do. Yes, it, um, that, happens on my code all the time. that happens on your code all the time. That's a personal problem, huh? <laughs> okay, okay. Good, thank you all very much.